So now, Maria, you grew up in Puerto Rico. So was that like kind of like a background for you to start Gullah Gullah Island from your experience? Yes. As a matter of fact, uh, I grew up in Puerto Rico, and I was born there and uh, came to the United States when I was six years old to live with my mom and my sisters. And um, by the time I got here, my mother was working two jobs in order to make ends meet. And so what she had to do when we were not in school was send us back to my grandmother's house in Puerto Rico. So every summer uh, after school was out, as soon as school was out in June, she would send us down to the island of Puerto Rico and then we'd come back in August when it was time for school because at least with school she could have a babysitter pick us up and so it was better to control her schedule. And also for us in the summer we grew up in Brooklyn, New York and East New York which was back then a pretty rough area for us and so my mom wouldn't let us out of the house and so in Puerto Rico I went from having this you know being a latchkey kid um, inside of a Brooklyn tenement to suddenly going to Puerto Rico and having this idyllic life where kids can play outside and you knew everybody on the block and my aunts lived across the street and my grandmother had fruit trees and so I always remember this growing up every summer in the islands as this idyllic environment where kids um, could play outside and be free and so when I left my legal career, I had been a lawyer for a while and um, I decided that I was going to create uh, TV shows. I was already in the entertainment industry representing writers as a lawyer and um, this was the first show that I created which was a show in which kids could play very much based on my experience in Puerto Rico. Um, I went to Nickelodeon and I pitched them the show idea. I was working with Spike Lee and, and Juan Sankey Lee, their sister, his sister and brother on another show, that's how I got to meet the people in Nickelodeon. And um, uh, they were really, they were interested in the concept of a show in which kids play, but they basically said to me, this is all, we like the idea, we like the idea of a show that's similar to Sesame Street without all that curriculum in it, um, and they liked the idea that I had, but they said it's all contingent on casting. Um, at the time, like I said, I was representing writers, and I was representing Gloria Naylor. Um, and Gloria Naylor lived, um, had a house in St. Helena Island. She also lived in Brooklyn. Gloria Naylor and I have been friends for many years. Um, we went to Yale together, so I've known her for years. And so I was representing her as a lawyer and um, on her book, Mama Day. Mama Day was a, a book based, um, fictionally, a fictional story based on the Sea Islands in part. And so she said, look, I have this house in St. Helen. I want you to come down to take a look um, at the area because we're going to shoot this film. She was producing it. I was the executive producer. And I had already um, attached um, uh, Lawrence Fishburne at the time to star in the movie. So Lawrence Fis Fishburne and his girlfriend and, um, and, a, and a few of us went down to do casting, to actually to do a scout in St. Helena Island. Um, while we were there, Gloria had a dinner party and invited some friends of her and some local uh, performers, Ron and Natalie Days, were invited to this dinner. Um, it was wonderful meeting them uh, because I feel like uh, when things are supposed to happen, you know, the planets line up and the stars line up and everything happens the way it's supposed to. And that was a, a magical moment for us because we had pitched, oh, I had pitched the show to Nickelodeon and they told me this is cast contingent, you know, this is a great concept, but it really depends who's going to play the role of the mother and the father in the show. Uh, and at the time, Barney was really big, and so we had the puppet already. We had come up with an idea for the puppet. I had called a woman named Kathy Minton um, because she had uh, worked with me on the Sankey and Joali project. So we'd met, and so we decided we were going to work together, form a company together. We had this great idea. Um, to do this this great show, but we didn't have the cast yet. So at this dinner party, we meet Ron and Natalie Days, and I say to them, "Oh my God, you know, you guys are perfect for the show that we've created for Nickelodeon. It doesn't have a cast yet. I mean, it didn't have the main leaders. And when I met them and I saw how talented and how first of all they were so personable. I mean, Ron um, at the time I didn't know he was such an amazing singer. As I found out later." that he had a great voice and that he's a, you know, a writer in his own right and, and that he is a musician and um, at least a, you know, a performer. And, and Natalie just had this bubbly personality that was just engaging. 
Um, and having looked at a lot of cast before, I mean, when I saw her, I said, she's really has this magic that I'm sure will appeal to kids. So I talked to them and I said, listen, I'm working on this show idea, um, and I think that you guys would be perfect. If you guys are interested, I'll talk to Nickelodeon when I get back, and I'll see if they want to meet you. And that's exactly how it happened. You know, we went down, they said, sure, we're interested. I don't think they really believed that anything would happen of it. Um, you know, entertainment is notorious for people coming up to you and saying, hey, I think you would make a great show, and then, you know, nothing happens. Sometimes not by the fault of the producers. Sometimes it's the fact that you get to the network and they've moved on or they decided they don't want the show or they, whatever. In this case, um, I went to Bron Johnson, who was the head of the network at the time, and uh, I, I, I'm sorry, um, uh, she was the head of Nick Jr. and um, and uh, uh, the rest of the people who were in charge of the network. There were a lot of the older folks who were there, and they. I said, "Look, I, I think I found a couple that I would like for you to meet. They're performers in their own right. They um, they travel around the Sea Islands performing a gala show. Gala is this amazing culture that's on the coast of the Sea Islands of the South Carolina and Georgia." And I've learned a lot from them in terms of the Sea Islands. My show originally was supposed to take place in Puerto Rico. And to me, uh, there was this magic about those islands that reminded me of my childhood in Puerto Rico. And that was that it was a place where people seem to be free to interact with the environment. And uh, it, it was tropical. For me, it felt tropical. I mean, I just felt this feeling. And in talking to Ron, when I first met him, I remember telling him about the foods in Puerto Rico and the customs in Puerto Rico and there was a connection with the way that I grew up in Puerto Rico and the way that they grew up in the Sea Islands um, and I felt like there was a sy synergy there that they could be the people to really personify this mother and father on the show. Um, it, it went well. We um, Natalie was pregnant at the time and Sarah was like three years old I think and um, so Natalie couldn't fly, so I basically had to fly the people from Nickelodeon down to the Sea Islands to meet with her. And um, not only were they meeting with her, just to see who they were, but also to see them interact with kids. I think we got a local school to agree to let us come and, 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 and see them or watch them interact in one of their shows, doing one of their shows with kids. And so we saw it immediately. I mean, the thing that I thought Natalie had, which is to go kind of through the screen and really touch kids and have kids appeal to her 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 ability to connect with kids was there immediately from that from that beginning. Um, Ron also just has this amazing voice and together they had this great um, energy and even though they were married um, which we discussed you know is being married performers a good thing or a bad thing you know and, and in this case it was a great thing because they had this performance they, they, they knew each other very well and and they had this great synergy so Nickelodeon um, saw what I saw in them as a couple and they agreed uh, to do a pilot. Um, I think this was 1992 when we first got the clearance to go ahead with the pilot. It took a year for us to do what we had to do as producers which was we had to get the money, we had to get the script, I had to finish the, um, the Bible which is something that I worked on very hard for a long time. I mean we have this amazing Bible that was like you know 50 pages long that basically outlined this is what the concept of the show is. This is what, where the episodes are going to take place. This is how we're going to shoot it. Um, we partnered up with a third partner who was uh, Kit Laborn. And Kit, you know, had, of course, years and years of experience in shooting and directing. Um, Kit was the director for the first um, few episodes. And so we worked with Kit uh, to go down to the Sea Islands. And he just had a very particular way of being able to capture the islands. There were some unique. Uh, customs and he was really interested in capturing the lifestyle that was down there and Ron and Natalie days you know were our entrance into that world I mean they brought um, the knowledge the connections and you know we brought the technical expertise and the creativity and you know they added to everything we did and um, you know I just think that it was a very good partnership among all of us everybody brought in something special and something unique and when you have that kind of synergy among people, um, you know, my, my job became more technical. I was sort of the, you know, the executive producer police, like, hey, Nickelodeon, we need more money, or hey, guys, we got to do this for less, or this is how we're going to shoot. And so we just, I mean, it was really low budget at the time. 
and all of us had 10 jobs. Um, I remember in the pilot doing hair and makeup for Natalie, which probably doesn't look that good right now. I, you know, there are many people who had an expertise that I didn't have, but um, you know, we would do everything. Everyone was doing everything just to make it happen. Um, from the beginning of that show, there was a magic among. I keep calling it magic because I meant that there was just this dynamic among the crew, the writers, the directors, and of course Ron and Natalie and all of the other performers in the show including the guy who played um, Binya Binya initially. There were two performers who played Binya Binya. And um, the first one, whose name was Philip, um, he was, yeah, he just created this amazing um, character out of Binya Binya. Because Binya Binya is a suit, after all, right? It was a suit. We, we had designers who worked on it really hard. It used to be something else. Before it was this yellow frog, it was this thing called Hodag, which was blue, and it had horns, and it was it was completely different. That didn't work. I mean, we tested that. Kids were scared. It didn't work. So that suit went in the box, and we came back, and we did it as a yellow frog. And so um, we, Gullah Gullah, the actual name of the show, came in with a conversation with Ron, who um, we wanted to call it Gullah because, you know, the, of course the show no longer took place in Puerto Rico, although initially we thought of making it there. Um, what I liked about the Gullah Sea Islands was that it was a culture within a culture. So here you are in America, but yet you go there and it feels like you have an extension of the original people who inhabited those islands. Like when you go to Puerto Rico and I am an, a, a black Puerto Rican, and so as a black Puerto Rican, I still feel that in the islands there's still a lot of customs that date back to Africa. And so the food that I eat in Puerto Rico tastes more like the food that they do in, Gull in the Gullah Sea Islands than anything else in other part of America. So I felt that what united that experience was the African connection. Um, and so you couldn't feel it more authentic than you do in the Sea Islands. So um, Ron you know, gave us a lot of the historical background and a lot of it had to do with the isolation of those islands that they were able to preserve a lot of those cultural traditions and foods and and, and in language in particular. So I, I've always been fascinated with language and how a language can survive in an area, in a geographic area. Um, and so in the Gullah Sea Islands, when I would hear the words that um, Ron and Natalie were using in their work, um, it made sense to me because we preserve Spanish in Puerto Rico and there were a lot of similarities of having a culture survive intact or adapting within another larger culture. And that's what why I felt it would work. Um, coupled with Ron and Natalie and coupled with Philip playing this this fictional character that was so charming and he was such a great dancer and talented and, and all of that. So everyone came together. We did the pilot. Um, we shot it in South Carolina. We found all kinds of performers or people in just people who lived there who were friends of Ron and Natalie that they introduced us to. We would go to the university, we did some research, we find out who else was doing different crafts. And so we wanted it to feel like we lived inside of a house, but when we stepped outside of the house with that family to go experience the environment that we were interacting with real people. And that's what made the show different. That whenever we went to the basket weaving women in Charleston, we were talking to the real people. And so the remotes, which is what we call those two minute segments in, that exist in every show, were all shot on location in South Carolina and Georgia. The rest of the show was going to be taped later in the Orlando studios. So we had to recreate um, a house that looked like it belonged in South Carolina, but it was in fact in Orlando. So that's where we got the house with the tree and the swing and everything that became the signature of Gullah Gullah Island. Uh, we took a lot of photographs. Um, we had an amazing art department in Orlando. I mean, those my favorite people in all of Orlando was the art department. Uh, and uh, so we were able to tap into all these creative people who had been living in Orlando, working in the studios and a lot of different shows. And by the time Gullah Gullah came down, as a series, you know, we took the uh, we took the the pilot, and it was tested in New York and in a lot of schools. Nickelodeon tested everything they did to make sure that kids liked it, and they could come back to us with notes and say, okay, they like this 
they like when Natalie does this, but they don't like when this happens. And so we would adapt it and we would change it until we got the right formula and until we knew that kids were embracing the concept. And so by the time we got ordered um, for first season, it was fantastic. We had already tested the pilot. We knew that Ron and Natalie were appealing to kids. We knew that kids loved the character, um, Binya Binya. We knew that they liked James. We knew that they liked Shayna. We knew that they liked the kids. And so we added Vanessa um, as a cousin who moved in because um, initially Sarah um, was also in the show, Ron and Natalie and their family, and of course the baby um, who grew up on Gullah Gullah Island, the baby who must be a man right now, I'm sure. Uh, he was such a you know beautiful baby. He grew up on the set, basically. We spent so much time together that um, he, we were all like family. And so I think that those are really nostalgic and you know really beautiful moments of how a cast can come together with a crew and the producers, and, and there was so much synergy there. Wow, that's so many things. Like one, I'm from New York, so and I grew up in the Queens area, so representing Brie K. And yeah, and I was just about to ask you that because when you guys moved to Orlando, was it like a different atmosphere for you? Like, what was your first impression of Nickelodeon Studios when you got there? Well, you know, you may be you 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 may be asking the wrong person because I loved my experience there. You know, I was single at the time, and so to be able to live your dream of doing a television show. I mean, I was so interested in doing a series and I had been in, in, in the entertainment industry for a long time, but more as a technical, as a lawyer, um, not on the creative side full time like I was. So for me, it was my dream to have my own show, to be able to work with people that I liked, um, to be able to see how the whole thing came together, all the business considerations. I mean, I had to deal with a lot of the drama of the money and the contracts and all the unpopular stuff, but you know, I could do that with pleasure because I knew that I would get to go down to Orlando three months at a time, sometimes six months at a time. We would get a nice apartment, we would rent um, a, a place, and then we get to live there and do our work. And to me, I mean, I loved Orlando. Again, it was an opportunity to get out of New York and lived in a, a nice apartment instead of a, like a little tiny apartment in New York City. And um, you know, Natalie and I. Um, really bonded right away so she and I would go exercise in the morning and so we'd go do our walks at five o'clock in the morning and so I felt like that was probably the healthiest time in our lives as well as fun I mean we got an opportunity to bond with the writers I mean Kaz Hyman who was the head writer for Kaz Hyman um, brought all the magic um, to, to, to Gullah Gullah Island in terms of the writing I mean he really made it come alive because he was able to spend time with the kids, spend time with Philip, spend time with Ron and Natalie, and be able to really um, capture their voices and, and still bring to it this, this, um, this humor and the storytelling like only he could do. Um, uh, Chuck Vinson, who was one of the main um, directors on our show, he probably directed like 80% of the shows that were done in Orlando. Um, Kathy Minton, you know, who was more the experienced technical person. I mean, Kathy knew everything about making a show. And even though I was the creative and sort of the legal mind and the deal maker behind everything, Kathy knew the numbers, Kathy knew the technology, and she knew how to bring the people together. So she and I balance each other really well. Um, and uh, who else? And then, of course, we had all the expertise of everyone down in Orlando. So. We would bring in the writers, we would bring in the directors and the talent, um, the main talent, and a lot of the supporting talent and cast came from Orlando. So we got to meet a lot of families who lived in Orlando and never really had an opportunity to be in a show. Um, of course, this was the first black show that Nickelodeon uh, was doing with a multicultural cast. Um, and that's really important because they really were behind it. They supported it all the way. So we made sure that our cast um, was uh, integrated, but so was our writing staff and our producing staff. It was the first time probably, and, and I don't know that many shows that have a producing staff and a, and, and a writing staff that was so integrated, and that was important. And that continues to be important because the reason that show captured the voice of African American and multicultural cast that it had was because it had writers like Kaz and writers performers like Ron and Natalie and directors like Chuck who could tell a story um, and be authentic, have this this voice that we 
knew was resonating with our audience. So when we would play it, and then I would go to some of the research sessions, the kids in the audience and the parents would be like, oh my God, this is a black show and my kids love it. Um, at the time, I had just I just met the, the, the man who became my husband, was a reporter, and we had just met some, somewhere along the show, you know, probably second season or something. And he went to a school and told them, he was speaking to some kids and said, oh yeah, my girlfriend um, works on Gullah Gullah Island. And the kids said, oh my God, they have a father in that show. Like it was the first time that these kids had ever seen a father in an intact family that was African American on television. And the fact was that they didn't have a father, so they could relate to Ron so well because he was providing this father figure for them. So I think we were um, impacting um, society at a lot of levels. So it's not just the fact that later we impact, it was fun and the songs were, were, were great and you remember the music, but you also remember a family and that family was intact and that family was imparting values that were important to the parents as well as was entertaining and different for kids. Um, our audience was, was, was mixed, right? So we had um, white kids who we would see when Ron and Natalie would tour afterwards as the seasons went on and you know we were renewed for like six different seasons. We, um, Ron and Natalie would travel and they would hear stories and bring back stories of how kids related to them. Um, I remember one story that Natalie used to tell all the time which was uh, a little white kid who was brought by her grandmother to one of the shows and she said, I want to be brown like Natalie. Um, so I, I think it's just all positive and that to me what I take away from having done that show for so many years was the fact that we, with, through the power of television and through the power of images, were able to influence a generation to see that, uh, that they were, that you could be a family, that you could be different, that you could have values, that you know, all the stereotypes that exist on television even to today. Um, you don't have to write television shows uh, that are stereotypical in order to gain an audience. You can write a responsible show showing positive images that is entertaining and appealing and successful and financially rewarding to companies uh, even though it has a normal intact black family. Like they actually exist. You know, we don't all have to be the welfare broken families out there, and that's not what we were espousing. We wanted to give a different view, and that's the, the, the truth for many of us is that we have wonderful families, and they're just not captured on television. So to me, Gullah Gullah Island is that. That's what that represents in my life. I agree because there is so many negativity among the black household, but this show just captures so many audiences and not just black audiences, you know, like you said, multi diverse audiences. And one thing I love was from the art department, like you said, they represented all the prop pieces and what you could say the all the traditional um, Gullah Gullah stuff. Like I remember one episode, Natalie, she had those handcrafted dolls that she used to make and that was a cool thing that was added to the show, I must say. Yeah, again, we used a lot of local artisans. Natalie is, is extremely talented herself. Um, in terms of crafts and art, so you know we relied on her a lot for a lot of the ideas. Um, but we also went to shops and and found the actual artisans that were friends of Ron and Natalie, uh, and and found the people who really did this. So they seem authentic because they were authentic. Um, we weren't making it all. And and then the art department in Orlando would take something that was authentic and really just make it bigger and you know television appropriate. Uh, I remember how how much fun the crew used to have and, and the art department in particular. I mean, that's where I would hang out. I would hang out in two places. And here was the executive producer. And when anyone was looking for me, they they were on the walkie-talkies at the time. Where's Maria? Where's Maria? Maria was missing. And she was either in the art department or in the hair and makeup. And so usually that's where the magic was happening. That's where they were recreating the looks. That's where they were making the props. And I found that to be just infinitely fun. And speaking of the hair and makeup department, that was one of the highlights when the studio tour happened, when the guests would watch you guys. Did you ever get to like wave up to the guests and maybe like, you know, say hi to them sometimes when shooting? 
Yeah, well, you know, we were, um, I felt like we were in a fish in a fish bowl, right? Because we were doing the shows, and part of the, ish, the, the attraction for Universal Studios was that in the Nickelodeon Studios, you could watch a television show being made. And so here we were um, doing our show and going about our business, hair and makeup, dressing, you know, and so whenever they were, you can't actually look at people getting dressed in the costume shop, but you could see part of it, if I recall correctly. Uh, and then the hair and makeup was was great. You could see people being transformed. But the problem was that we would totally forget that people were looking at us because these tours came by all day. So after a while, you're focused on what you're doing and you're zoning out all the people that are looking at you. So we had an incident in which, you know, there were all these rules that Binya Binya could not take his head off. Now, the head of this costume was like 25 pounds, if I recall correctly. And so whenever Philip would get tired, he could only be in his head for like 15 minutes at a time. And so whenever, you know, the 15 minutes were up, um, Chuck Vincent, who was, like I said, the main director, would start screaming in the mic, I got Binya in the head. I got Binya in the head. So all the kids would straighten up and everybody would act right and do their scene because they know we have 15 minutes and then he couldn't breathe anymore. So we had to take the head off. But sometimes we would forget that there were tours, and the problem with, with taking off the head in the tour is that you could traumatize a child for life. I mean, you did not want to take off Binya Binya's head if there was a kid looking. And so we created this little dressing room right off the set in which Binya Binya could go in and take off his costume and, and have a beverage and refresh himself. But those were those incidents that we would have to uh, remember, make sure that Binya doesn't take off his head when there's a tour. So we loved having the tour, but we totally got used to it and forgot about them. I, I always wondered about that costume and that hat because I always imagined it was just a one-piece costume, but that hat was like, wow, you know, I've always wanted to know how, what was it like to be inside there. So thank you for saying that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah, well, you know, it, was, it wasn't one piece. It was two pieces, and it was very hot, and it was, you know, all kinds of mechanics. So the head is 25 pounds, and it had... Um, all kinds of controls to open the eyes and the mouth and so even though you weren't hearing him speak because that was added later the sound if Binya Binya made any sound we would add that later but um, we he had to control the ma the mechanics in his in his hand everything was loaded inside the head it was really um, pretty intricate uh, three design was the the company that designed the uh, the, the actual character the, the physical outfit the, um, the rest of the body, um, he could be in it, but it was just really hot, you know, and no matter how much you had the air conditioner on, it was just the lights and the cameras and everything else that was going on in the set was pretty intricate. So we learned how to shoot around um, the schedule. We would try to shoot everything that didn't involve uh, Binya Binya first, and then whenever he was in that head, we had to rush. We had to, you know, get the scene, and the great thing was that he was an amazing performer, like I said, and so he was able to um, do it quickly and we always got great, great reactions and dancing with a big heavy custom in your head was not easy either so he made it look easy and um, but but it was a lot of work. Do you remember other shows being taped there where you were at? Oh yeah, uh, let's see, because there were several, you know, we were there for, for a few years and uh, we would come back every year and the schedule became kind of a, a routine. I think we would go to Beaufort, South Carolina, or the Sea Islands to tape the remote pieces around April. Because I remember one of the first shows that we did, Simeon was so little that he was just learning how to say daffodils. So till this day, that was one of the early shows where he was the, all the daffodils were out. So that has to be about April or early May. We would go down there and tape uh, for two weeks, and later it became almost a month. And then uh, we would go back to New York and cut those episodes over the summer. Um, make all the little remote sections and then go back and tape the rest of the stories. Uh, in uh, August or so September, we moved down to uh, to Orlando. We would stay there till December. Um, the problem was that if anything happened with the way people looked between April and you know September, we'd have to match the pieces that we shot months before to there. So one 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 story was that Natalie at one point uh, cut her hair and so. The challenge was how do we match the longer hair she had um, in the remote to the um, the new short hair that she had, and she looked quite beautiful. I mean, she'd lost weight and she cut her hair real short, 
So I remember having to fly her to New York to get a wig made so that it matched the pieces that we shot in April. So, you know, pre regular production challenges, but those were the, 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 the real, the reality of, of shooting a show and, and, you know, she had a right to look however she wanted and we had to match it. And so part of it became then how do we match the wig and I'm sure Natalie remembers the, the days of matching the hair to the previous hair and it was only, the only reason we had to do that was because we shot all of this footage uh, in April that we then had to match to the footage that was done later in the year. I do remember that hairstyle because, you know, in the probably like seasons one or two, she did have the shorter hair and then seasons three to four, she did, have, she did have the longer hair. So you could definitely tell when the seasons or episodes were changing because that's when Tristan joined the show. Tristan Mays in the later yeah. cast. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yes, but I love Gullah Gullah Island and I also love Taino. Was doing that show, did you always like dream about, you know, a little... Puerto Rican girl just fulfilling her dreams, was that just an accomplishment for you as a child to see that in front of a TV screen? Yeah, you know, um, we we were very successful with Gullah Gullah Island. I mean, like I said, I think that it was the synergy of all these really talented people staying together. One of the things that I know about Gullah Gullah was that we kept a pretty intact crew and team with Orlando and so every year it would come back it was just uh, like meeting family all over again and we all love hanging out together and we we became friends and you know now with Facebook being this new thing in our world in terms of communicating um, there's a lot of people who have reached out to each other and to me I mean I still get calls and people wanting to be friends on Facebook and so it's been great to reconnect with people again and so that shows you that that was a really positive experience for a lot of people uh, when when that show was over, when finally Nickelodeon decided that it wasn't going to pick up the show for another season, it was devastating to all of us because it meant that we weren't going to go back to Orlando. There were other shows that were being taped there. Like I said, um, there was All That, Keenan and Kel, um, and a bunch of other shows. Um, Allegra's Window, first year, I think it was. So there was there were many shows that were happening down there at the time, and um, and we got to know the kids. You know, every time every time I see Nick Cannon. You know, and, and some of these big successful shows now I'm like, I remember when Nick Cannon was running around the hallways in Nickelodeon, you know, doing his show. So uh, we, we, we finished that show and so one of the things that Kathy and I did, Kathy Minton and I did, was that they gave us um, development deals to do other shows and so a development deal basically said, you know, we, we've enjoyed working with you guys, we've had a, a good run with Gullah Gullah Island, we're not going to do it anymore but um, we do want to see what else you have and so we each came up with a different show idea we're still working together and um, and then we brought in different show ideas and so I did uh, Taina under my development deal I came up with a show about a girl who was 15 year old Puerto Rican who lived in New York City and she just had this crazy dreams to be a star and um, and so that show went to pilot and the pilot got tested once again and did really well so that show was picked up for series and that was no longer Nick Jr., that was Nickelodeon. Mm -hmm. And we did the first season uh, in Orlando of Taina. Taina was done there as well. And so Taina just became uh, a bigger show. Uh, the talent was from L.A., so we brought Taina and some of the cast members from different places. But they were from L.A., so you know a lot more agents involved, a lot, a lot bigger show. Um, not so local like um, the talent was from uh, Gullah Gullah Island. We, we could hire everybody from Orlando. Uh, I think that with Taina already a lot of people started coming from LA and so it just it was a little different in that um, everybody was uh, super professional and had worked on a lot of big productions so when you have um, when I say professional I mean that when they've worked in bigger productions they need more things more support and so the show became more expensive and it became just a whole different nature it became bigger um, for me it was great it was my show idea and I wanted to to really explore a Puerto Rican character, which I, I really didn't explore except as a supporting character in Gullah Gullah Island with um, Iris, the, the, the Iris Chacon, who was the neighbor next door and she was the mother to two of the kids that hang out at Ron and Natalie's house. So that was um, in Gullah. Here we were able to make a main character be a Puerto Rican girl. And the show did really well. You know, again, we did two seasons. Um, the second season, uh, they 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 already started changing the relationship to Universal Studios. I'm not aware of the technical reasons why that relationship changed or ended or, 
or whatever happened, but I know that we were asked to go to, um, to L.A. And um, so we started using Universal Studios in L.A. for second season of Taina. So again, you know, they shifted the shows, and so I ended up in the, in the Nick Studios there. That's how we ended up leaving Orlando. But uh, I tell you, I still have friends from those days, and I, I still really look at that experience as nothing but positive, and um, I feel like I have friends for life from that, that experience. Yeah, because it's funny because when Universal Studios for Taina, I always feel like it was a really great platform to start from because one, the studio is really huge and the set is could really support a show like that, a musical show. And there's so many rumors about the Taina was being expensive to make and that's why it was canceled. And a lot of people were so sad into that in the end. Like, do you know why? Yeah, you know, it, it was... It, when you look at television shows in different uh, in different companies, you know it's always about the bottom line. I would say that the majority always has to do. There's always an issue with money, right? As you get a bigger cast who um, has performed in other shows, so they are more experienced. They are demanding more money, and so that impacts the bottom line. And suddenly, a show that you created to do for I don't know. Two hundred thousand dollars an episode, or something like that, um, suddenly becomes three hundred and fifty, and then before you know it, it the money that the money doesn't make sense for the network. So from the network point of view, um, I think that part of the issue was if you if it becomes too expensive, they just won't consider it. There are many other people pitching them much cheaper shows, and so they have to measure um, the bottom line with. Uh, what they budgeting for that show. I mean, it doesn't mean they don't have the money. It just means they don't have the money for this show. So, I mean, I was very clear. Also, being a lawyer and having worked in entertainment and done so many television deals, I knew going in that um, simply because they give you a budget doesn't mean that they want to give you more or you can negotiate, but your leverage when you are first year show, you haven't really proved your worth, you know, and so you're not friends, right? You're not... Um, how the Friends cast can get together and demand more money or they don't go back. You can't do that when you have a new show because they'll just replace you. And so I think that, yeah, the financial aspects was an issue. Um, there were some cast issues too, you know, there were some 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 issues with the cast and so I think um, it, it was just a, the combination wasn't there. But again, Taina had um, some of the elements of Gullah Gullah in terms of the magic of the, the kids coming together um, Christina Vidal, the lead in that show, amazingly talented girl, very young and very talented. Um, you know, when you're working with teenagers, they have regular teenage issues. So we had a bunch of teenagers in our entire cast, and so we were dealing with um, just teenage growing issues, and so that affected sometimes the people who would come back or were not interested in coming back, and so, so we had a little bit of that. Uh, and, um, and then moving to L.A., um, didn't have the same kind of synergy in terms of the, the the filming of it that it had in Orlando. I think Orlando just created this really warm kind of friendly atmosphere and when you go to LA is business, it's all business. I agree, I mean the Nick Studios in Florida was really a family friendly atmosphere and one of the things that Taino and the differentiated from Gullah Gullah was shooting in front of a live studio audience and especially at Universal Studios where regular park guests could, could attend a live taping. That must have been a great experience for you as well. To that see. was fantastic. I mean, being able, you know, the thing about doing a sitcom and working with writers um, like Kaz, who was also working with me on that show, and so was the director, Chuck Vinson, uh, was that we were able to, we knew each other so well, and we allowed each other to do the work that we do, and um, Kaz was sitting there, you know, with his writing staff. And so when you have a studio audience, you can see if the line was funny or not. They would laugh. Otherwise, they won't laugh. And so what you have is you have this real-time response. And you really can fix some things in editing. But if it's not funny, if the line isn't funny, you're not going to make it funny in editing. So we had an opportunity to go back and recreate the scenes or fix the lines or fix the words. And you had that immediate response. It's almost like live theater which is what doing a show in front of a live uh, studio audience was for us. And so it was exciting and it was different and it wasn't uh, like Gullah Gullah, we would do the show and you don't know how kids are going to react until you, sh you, you shoot it and you edit it at the end. 
with with this with Taina, we had an immediate response to the writing. It was either funny or it wasn't. So it was great. We had a great group of kids. I mean, Renee and the who, the girl who played Renee, um, Kalia Adams, and you know all the boys and all the girls. They just they they were they were bonded. I mean, they really you that that sort of. Um, that sort of connection between the cast, you could see that on, on the screen. And it really, again, uh, an opportunity to do a show like that with a multicultural cast doesn't come around that often. And, and those of us who are people of color who've worked in television for many years, we understand how rare the opportunity to do a show with, with an entire cast of color is. One of my favorite episodes was the Blue Mascara with 3LW. That's one of my favorites. <laughs> Do you remember that? So, that's funny. That was the very first episode we ever taped. Mm -hmm. So, uh, <coughs> yes, I remember 3LW. And uh, so how that happened, we were casting for a musical group. We were going to put it together. And I went to a party. And I ran into my college roommate. So my freshman year at Yale, I had a roommate uh, named Tease Williams, and Tease was in the music industry, and so Tease uh, had a group, and she was the manager of this group. She put this group together, 3LW, and in fact, one of them was her sister. And um, so I ran into her in this party, and I said, hey, we're doing this show in, in Nickelodeon, and uh, kind of like how I ran into Naran and Natalie and you know met them and saw that they were the right people. I said, listen, we're doing this show, and we're looking for a music group. She says, I have the music group for you. They're called Three Little Women, and here's their tape. And she literally gave me a cassette. I mean, that's how long ago. It wasn't even it was on a tape. It wasn't even like on a DVD. And so <laughs> she gives it to me, and I literally pop it on a cassette player. <laughs> you guys know what that is. Oh, I know. I know. I know that. You know what that old. <laughs> it's old. It's like, it's old. <laughs> Here we are on Google Hangout, right? <laughs> yes, I know. Thanks to this, uh, <laughs> we're taking it back now. <laughs> taking you back. So I play that, and I hear the what was the first song? Oh, promises, promises. That song. <laughs> and I was like, wow, this is great. Let me put them on the show. We literally did that like in a day. And we, so I, I was like, I have a band. We're, we're gonna, we have a group. Three, three little women. I don't know who they are, but put them in the show. Anyway, so they were in the show, and it was that first episode. I mean, we, we taped with them, and they were so funny. They were great. Taina was so great wanting to be one of the girls, and mm -hmm. especially the bathroom scene. I remember the bathroom scene where she was pretending to be one of them, and Did of course, you, she didn't know they were outside the door. Yeah. Oh, my God. Really, really cool, I must say. And one of the great things about being at Universal, um, I guess the studios was um, all the rides. Did you have a favorite ride or attraction at Universal Studios in Florida? Yeah, but I don't know if I'll get arrested if I say, you know, that we used to go and, like, sneak in the back door. <laughs> oh, so. the, a lot of people say that, all the former employees or the people who work oh, there. Oh, good. I'm <laughs> glad. It wasn't illegal. <laughs> well, what was great is, you know, we were working. We were working all day, so we didn't have time to stand in a long line. So one of the benefits of being, in, uh, being there was that we um, – as an employee, if you had an employee badge, you can go to the rides. And so any, anytime anybody wanted a thrill in the middle of the day, they'd go to the big roller coaster, and they would just get in through the back and all get on the ride and just do one of those. I forget which one it was. It was it was new at the time, and it was just yeah, this big. Yeah. It, yeah, nah, yeah. I've always I'm, I'm I did not like that, but they would force me to get on there, and I was it was like, oh my god, I'm gonna die on this thing. Anyway, so we would go take this ride, have some lunch in the park, and then run back to the set. So yeah, that was great. It was great being in the park because we all were like kids. You know, whenever anybody wanted to just run out and 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 get, and most of the times we had meetings during lunchtime. So the executives were back having meetings, changing the scripts, you know, and and rewriting things for the afternoon, but the cast got an opportunity to run out there and, and try all the rides, and that was a lot of fun. I think the E.T. ride would have been a gentler ride for you, if you remember the E.T. that, that had the own thing. <laughs> that thing I that rode that ride. I was on that ride. <laughs> And whenever my niece and nephews uh, would come up to visit, you know, it was great being able to to uh, see them and, and, and them meeting the cast, but also they would get to ride the ride, so they were like, Cool meeting Taina, but we gotta go. We gotta go to the park. So mm -hmm. they 
And what was one of the good things about living and working in Orlando? Because, you know, it was kind of small, but it's a bigger town now when Gullah Gullah was there. And you got, I don't know if you guys ever went to, out into town or go to Disney World or go at the shopping malls, but on Tyena, when Universal City Walk was there, there was more clubs and restaurants to go to, you know? Yeah, this- well, we did all of that, right? Because, you know, we would shoot regular schedule and then we would be there on weekends. You couldn't leave. A lot of people who lived in New York and had families would take off and come home and see their husband or their wife and they would leave on Friday nights and come back on Sunday or Monday morning. We, if you didn't have anything back home, you would stay there and really explore the city. So those of us who would move down there, we'd go to every single restaurant we would hear about. We would go downtown. I mean, initially we started doing all Universal Studios and staying in that area, and then we realized, oh, there's a whole world downtown that we don't know about. And so we started going to the restaurants. I remember going to the one that was on top of a bank that you could see, 360, you could see around, really fancy restaurant that was very nice on top of some kind of bank downtown. We went, um, I started exploring a little more. We would drive outside of Orlando, but the mall, I mean, we basically would go to the mall and then we would go to the outlets. Uh, you remember the, the outlets were there, and so you could get bargains. So whenever people would get paid, I mean, they would run to the outlets and just spend money. So I felt like we were there visiting and living, but we were really contributing to the economy because as soon as everybody would get paid, they were like, okay, we're going to go to the mall and the outlets. And so that's where everybody wanted to hang out. And um, But there were some really nice cultural... You know, it's interesting. Yes, we were good at Disney. Um, there were what there was one uh, director in particular who used to like to go and celebrate um, that that New Year's Eve midnight every night at Disney. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> there was a '70s club there that we used to go to. Um, what was it called? Is the '70s? It was a 1970s club. Uh, I don't know, polyester or something. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> Funny. <laughs> what it was called but that was one club we would frequent uh, and we just hung out we really had we went anytime there was good food we'd be there so I mean I have nothing but positive things to say about Orlando now you know I had some some colleagues who would go I hate Orlando is so hot and it rains every day so it would rain there would be this torrential rainstorm at four o'clock in the afternoon every day in August or something and so uh, we would stop shooting because it was so loud and we could hear the rain and then we would just resume so again to me it was tropical so I loved anything that was hot and rainy and all of that stuff I loved it so some people called it a swamp land but uh, I I, I thought it was uh, reminded me of home yeah it's strange because it's kind of a win-lose situation there like you said I did hear from colleagues that they they just hated there but then other people like myself who loved it and I always visit there with family because I have relatives there and they, they do have nice shopping malls I must say like really extravagant. I'm sure the Taina cast they probably got um, probably got hounded a lot by teenagers whenever they saw them at the malls, or maybe they got hounded by screaming fans or something like that. Oh yeah, oh yeah, and even even Ron and Natalie, you know, got 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 a uh, you know their share of being followed by little kids. I remember Natalie telling me once, you know, I'm just trying to go to the bathroom. I don't know if it was an airport or something, and some little girl was chasing her into the bathroom and, like, trying to look under the stall, you know? So so they just, you know, the thing about little kids is that they don't know the difference um, when somebody is behind the screen or in front of the screen. And so one of the biggest reality for us is when you have a three-year-old and they see you on television, you're real to them. So when they see you in real life, they want to touch you. They want to. They want to talk to you. They want to be with you. And uh, you know that that happened a lot to to Ron and Natalie. And you know we're behind the scenes, and nobody knew what I looked like. So I could go anywhere, and I was totally fine. You know? Right, right. Good for you, I must say. I guess you were. Like... <laughs> yeah. But um, one of the good things about the Nick Studio was um, getting. Of course, the slime geyser outside the front, and then the Gat Kitchen. Were you ever slimed or ever get to see someone else get slimed? Listen, I was never slimed. <laughs> and the reason was I could not get any slime on my hair because I <laughs> that out of there. So I'm not trying to be, you know, I have black women's hair. I am not trying to put any gook on it and then I have to get it up. <laughs> all right, all right. That's a good thing. <laughs> but I guess every... Although I had pretty good friends in the hair and makeup department, so I'm sure they would hook me up. But uh, 
Carol Rashid in particular, and you know, mm -hmm. all the girls in the hair and makeup were just you know wonderful. Again, people who uh, have remained very dear to 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 us. We don't contact each other as often anymore, but you know, we certainly had uh, after the show. Yeah, it was truly kind of a great time to be there. The staff who worked there who were just so incredible. Everyone I talked to said they were just some of the best people ever. Like, how great was all the staff who worked at Nick? I always had positive experiences. Okay. All I can say is, is everything I can say is positive. You know, uh, we, we had monitors throughout the, uh, the building. Um, for the people who were working on the show, they could see when the shoot was happening. They could see when things were over. They can see when we would cut for a break and then everybody would run into whatever they had to do next. And so that was one of the few shows, Gullah Gullah Island, where people actually watched intensely. And there were scenes sometimes in which there were, I remember a show with James when he was jealous because his dad um, was helping another kid. And he was really jealous in the show. He he didn't want to share his dad with somebody else, with a new friend, and so then he became mean to his friend, and uh, and I, I just remember walking through the halls and seeing people looking at the monitor, and like, you know, tears in their eyes, and I'm like, what's going on here? I mean, they really got into it. It was really great to watch, though. So people were just uh, connected to the storyline of the show. It wasn't just, it wasn't just you know working there. I mean, I think a lot of people, I'm sure for a lot of people, it was a job, but there was something extra and you can always tell because when it's time to go home people would want to stay there and kind of hang around and so we had a, a group of people who wouldn't mind going out and having a drink after work and still socializing uh, with the people that they were working with to me that's always a good sign that people are bonded and, and are you know they have families and they gotta go home and they go home but you know it's nice when you get to spend a little time outside of work just getting to know each other Absolutely. I mean, if you're working around people for that long, you're bound to get bond with some way or another. But when you're in the golden age of television and doing all that, it's truly just an awesome experience. And how do you feel knowing that these shows, Gullah Gullah, Taina, they've made such a positive impact on the 90s Nickelodeon? I mean, they're still loved by people today. And so many people write about it and say it was just the best time for a kids' television ever. I, you know, I'm, I'm humbled, honored, and I say I think it's wonderful. I think I, I know that that I enjoy making it, and I know that how it came together and how all the pieces came together almost felt like there was, you know, divine connection among all the people. And I, I can't say that about all television shows, you know, but that that have an impact the way that this one had on kids. I remember recently, you know, in the, in the recent year, somebody uh, saying, you know. Nickelodeon, um, I don't think, realized what it had in Gullah Gullah Island. This is what this researcher said to me. Because um, they worked on, uh, on, on uh, Sesame Street, and they said that when they heard of Gullah Gullah Island, they saw the impact um, that it had on kids. They were really concerned because they finally saw a show that could knock you know, Sesame Street off the radar in a way. Not that it would replace it, but that it had that type of power that Sesame Street had to last and the longevity and the um, and the impact that it had on kids and to me that was very flattering you know that a show like Sesame Street that I respect and I like and I thought you know was a show that I grew up with um, was compared and that they were worried that we were going to take it over so I think that was great I, I, I'm very competitive so I like that <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm happy that um, that it has this impact and that people still think about it and read about it I mean, every once in a blue moon when I have nothing better to do, I'll Google the name and I'll see all these little groups of people who, I'm YouTube, they have people with the songs, they have groups that follow it, they have people who think about it. Uh, the show still airs uh, a lot of times. You know, that show went international. It sold like in 30, I, last time I checked it was in 30 something countries mm -hmm. in different languages throughout the world. So it was a show that was not just uh, an American show, it was a show that went international. Uh, so it's, ha it's impact a lot of people even that I don't even know. So to know that I had a part in bringing together a group of people that could create uh, a show that had lasting memory and impact kids' lives is amazing. And I hope to get the opportunity to do it again. And 
I hope that Gullah Gullah Island gets redone. Hey, listen, I mean, I would love nothing more than being able to say, hey, let's redo that show and let's make it more contemporary, let's make it on the web. Um, and because I think, too, the magic that we were able to create was really to just get in touch with kids' psyche and really entertain kids and really talk about what was important to them. And the show always had kids as the primary focus and making sure that it applied to them and that it was responsible for them. And I think, like, like Ron has said, that uh, when he had a three-year-old kid, he wanted to be able to have um, representation on television that wasn't just blonde, blue-eyed girls and kids. Um, and now with a six-year-old myself, I worry about the same thing today. Here I am now as a parent looking at television, looking at animated characters, looking at live-action characters, and I don't see my daughter represented. So I still think we have more room to continue to do work like that and um, hey, I welcome the opportunity of working on another show like that with another great team. I'm glad that you said that because I was hoping for a reunion one day with you and the Gullah Gullah team. I mean, it has to happen, I must say, and it would be really cool to see that happen. Um, just well, two more questions. This interview that you're doing will inspire people to come together. That would be so fun. Oh, thank you so much. Yes, definitely. But just two more questions. But. You know, the Nick Studios, it's been closed for like nine years now. Would you like to see it be reopened one day? Do you think it should come back? Wow. I mean, I know that's a complicated business decision, but in terms of the impact and the work that was done there, that would be amazing. I would love to have it come back. Absolutely. I would take my daughter there. Yeah, yeah, just like we were saying, you know, have her see, I don't know, maybe Game Lab or see a live taping or something like that. It was really cool. and. It was certainly a huge attraction at Universal and in Orlando specifically, I must say. And it's touched a lot of people's lives. And what do you think made it so great and special in Florida? Um, the, you know, it always comes down to the people, right? Um, and it's, it's people plus the opportunity to do good work. Uh, we had a team of people on air, we had a team of people that worked at the studio, and then we had a creative team that came together with the writers and the directors and the producers that were able to capture the words that were on screen. And, you know, I can't forget to emphasize the music. I mean, this show had so much music, and the music was so fun and so relevant, and, you know, Ron and Natalie and their voices and, and the kids and, you know, being able to capture a family and being able to capture these values and being able to reflect a place that was foreign because it was a world that hadn't been seen in television but was familiar at the same time, which was that could be your home. So I think it's that formula that made Gullah Gullah a success were all those pieces coming together. Definitely, definitely. And with the studio there, it helped achieve a lot of those goals, especially with kids visiting and saying, you know, hey, that's Binya Binya. I want to see, see who that is. But it was really was a good time. And this documentary, I'm just hoping that, you know, Nickelodeon Studios was an awesome place to be at. And you're the 70, 71st people person I've talked to now. So. Wow, that's yeah. a lot. That's amazing. Congratulations on that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And I know you said you have to be an appointment, so I'm going to let you go now. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for including me. I appreciate you inviting me. Thanks for your patience uh, getting this together. And um, we'll talk soon. Congratulations oh. on doing this. Oh, thank you so much. And yes, I'll give you a call when the interview is posted, and I'll tell you when. I'll, show, I'll share the link to you. Okay. Thanks a lot. All right. Bye-bye. Take care.